Hey guys, we're on episode number 10 of our podcast that was nameless for the first several episodes. Um, but AJ said by number 10, we're going to have a, a name and uh, we came up with a name. Um, and so we want to introduce a short clip before we um, interview Brian Butler of Altitude Exotics. Um, and uh, we came up with the name, The Gecko Pod. And AJ, do you want to talk a little bit about the name and how... Uh, what it means, yeah. things like that. Yeah, um, I think really it's it's kind of two meanings. One, obviously, we are trying to be the go-to place for gecko news and interviews and content. So the gecko pod, we want to be the place you go to. And then also just from a community standpoint, the pod mentality um, is really a community of people that are interested in the same thing, committed to the same yeah. ideas, and really kind of moving in the same direction with the hobby. So it's uh dual meaning but very simple and that was kind of the goal yeah awesome yeah and then we'll we'll figure out all the uh social stuff we'll have an instagram and um yeah we'll yeah. we'll let you guys know how to connect and and whatnot so yeah we're excited for the name uh moving forward and uh yeah we'll see you guys for many more episodes all right welcome to episode 10 of our podcast um Today, we are uh, um, blessed to have uh, Brian Butler from Altitude Exotics. My name is Harry from Zero's Geckos. We have AJD uh, Reptiles, AJ's co-hosting. And uh, yeah, we just interview breeders, um, mainly crested right now, huh? but we'll, yeah. we'll eventually get to <laughs> different different geckos. But uh, crested gecko breeders right now. Down, you know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> why, why would we ever crested go anywhere there? else? We're already doing the best <laughs> geckos. <laughs> Yeah, and so um, no, um, Brian, we we met you. I this is my first time I met you this past weekend um, at Tinley, and uh, it was awesome. It was really, is really good meeting you because you is actually when I first started getting into crested geckos, your video was first to pop up, and so <laughs> I was watching your videos. It's like, and then you know my kids were watching your videos, and uh, you were kind of my entryway into uh, the crested gecko world, and now I'm. I'm knee, neck deep in crested geckos with. And you're interviewing <laughs> the guy that you were watching his YouTube <laughs> videos, right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. And so Dude, my um, plan has worked perfectly. Yeah, that's I all know. Very <laughs> stuck in the funnel. Before you know it, <laughs> you guys got me. You guys got me. Um, and so it's an honor. It's an honor to be uh, talking with you and chatting with you. And um, AJ, you know Brian beforehand as well since both of you guys yeah, have man, been in I, the hobby i know that so we've long. both bred geckos a long time and have run in the same kind of circles so probably all the way back to pangea forums and all that stuff back in the day so, yeah i was gonna yeah. say your name's one i've been seeing pop up for yeah. as long as i can remember yeah sure. it's been a long time so i started did, did in you start oh, around the same i started time? in oh five oh six so okay i was like oh nine is when i first okay. got into okay it. Yeah, yeah so around the that's same cool. time wow that's yeah. awesome um, and so, yeah, Brian, just a quick get to know you. Where were you born and raised? Um, and yeah, just a little bit about yourself. You don't have to go too deep. Yeah, I was uh, born in Denver, Colorado. I still live in the Denver area. I've been here most of my life, a couple jaunts to a different a couple different cities in Colorado, but always kind of hung around this area. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. And so that's where um, everything is located. Do you have like a facility yeah. or is everything in your house? Um, I call it a facility, but it's, uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's in my basement. So when I bought this nice. house, I bought it specifically for the gecko business. The basement yeah. is what really was my only requirement when I was shopping was the basement had to meet the specs that I wanted so I could keep everything there. And then whatever the rest of the house was, I would make it do. So that's nice. That's have you expanded, it was specific for it. Have you expended on your house since you're, I think you have like a ton of geckos, right? We'll talk about that later. <laughs> I have. I was thankfully okay. forward thinking, very thankfully, considering how yeah. the real estate market went. Yeah. I had uh, large ambitions when I bought this house and I've now pretty much run it max capacity all the time. But it's mm. it's enough. If it, if I got much bigger, it would cause more problems. And it's like I kind of like that I'm confined to space and I have to make decisions not to go bigger than that. <laughs> yeah, no, I got you, man. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, and then you've been doing it, uh, you just mentioned, since 2009? Yeah, 2009 is when I got into it. Cool, that's awesome. Then. 14 years-ish, almost 14 years. Yeah, yeah. It's been a while. And did you start like everybody else, buying a gecko from Petco or, you know? <laughs> I feel like everybody's got the yeah, same story. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. I, I love this story. Cause mine's a little bit different, so I. it was so happenstance that I fell into it. 
I always liked reptiles. Like growing up as a kid, I was out catching snakes and turtles and frogs and stuff, but I never really had any pets. And then uh, one night when I was, I might not even have been 21, 20 or 21, I was working a night job and uh, I was driving home with the girl I was dating at the time. And I was tired and grumpy as like, I have to go to work in like six hours. I want to go home and go to bed. She wanted to stop at the pet store and look at the cute animals. And I was pissed off. I was just like, <laughs> this is dumb. I'm exhausted. I work at 2 a.m. I don't want to do this. And she drugged me in there anyways, mm. went over to the reptile section and the guy pulled out the coolest looking little lizard I'd ever seen. And uh, it was like, it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. I was my, I was blown away that something could be that weird looking and soft, but you could buy it yeah. for like 50 bucks. It was wild. <laughs> what, what morph was it? God, I couldn't even tell you. I don't even remember what it looked like, to be honest. I didn't get a gecko for like a year after that, too. Yeah. I always remembered it, and I always wanted one, but I didn't live somewhere that I could have one as a pet. And then when I finally got got uh, a different apartment with another girlfriend, not the same girl, I found a couple on Craigslist, and I bought a couple off this girl on Craigslist. I got two two males. I actually still have the tank that I got them in. It's right on the other side of this wall. Nice. It's got a croquet gecko in it now. <laughs> And then it was uh, kind of all downhill from there. I had a couple and a, a friend of mine called me. I was showing them to her. I showed her like picture, you know, this is like 2009. So I probably emailed her a picture. I downloaded off my little point and shoot camera or something like that back then. And I sent her a picture of it and she was like, oh, I have one of those. My boyfriend's going to buy a male for me at the next reptile expo and I'm going to breed them. And I was just like, I, what did, I didn't understand what you just said. Awesome. What the hell's a reptile expo? <laughs> I mean, there's like a place you can go see a bunch of these and you, you're telling me I can make more of these things in my house. I got to try this. That sounds awesome. That's funny. And then you fell down the rabbit hole and never came out. Yep. So. I got online and it was morphs and patterns and mutations. And it's like, I've always said, it's like Pokemon for adults. You got to have one of all of them. Got to collect them all. That makes sense. It's the same thing. I loved Pokemon when I was a kid. So it makes sense. Honestly. Everybody I've talked to that every reptile person is like, oh yeah, I like Pokemon. It's the same it makes thing. a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. We just transferred our addiction at about age 15 or so. Yeah. You know, we just started trading uh, real animals instead of actual pieces of <laughs> Cards. cardboard. Exactly. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now it's a trend to take your real animals and make a fake Pokemon card with them on there. It's come full and circle. And then trade those. Yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love that. So um, I want to ask you a little bit, Brian, about, I guess, animals. I'm not going to say specific um morphs you work with or anything because i want to keep it broad um but from mm -hmm. kind of those early years reflecting back on you know having a vision of the animals that maybe you wanted to make um in those early years you know probably in 2009 it was pinstripes it was flames it was maybe dalmatians different things like that mm -hmm. what kind of did you what was your approach to refining and maybe dreaming up these animals that were either not available yet or had not been seen yet um and what's changed from then until today as far as your approach um so yeah that whole idea is really what got me hooked that's okay that idea is what got me into like i want to do this mm -hmm. for a living this is yeah. i want this just to be a fun thing i do after work mm -hmm. it's the idea that i can picture an animal in my head that physically doesn't exist in the world and then make it a reality just by the right combination of reading. I like, that's mm. fascinating to me. Yeah. I was blown away that that's something you could do. It's like, yeah, it's, it sounds really egotistical, but it's like playing God. It's like, you feel like you can play God. Like I can imagine an animal and just make it because I want to. I think about like, that's a very big headed way of putting it, but essentially that's what we do. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a really fun. neat feeling. I, think. I mean, we're basically artists working with living animals as our canvas, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's very much, it's, it's artistic. It's, it's the same as a sculpture. I picture it the same as I've heard a, a quote about Da Vinci, how he could see the man inside the, the marble the before he does it visualize the man. Yeah, It's the same thing. It's the same concept. You can see the animal before you actually create it yeah. and you just have to figure out how to make it. So along the lines when you did that what were some findings or learnings that you had as far as maybe mistakes that didn't go so well if you have any examples of things that were harder to make than others i, I just love to kind of dig deep on this and and maybe hear a little bit of your process on the art that you're making 
<laughs> yeah, the the biggest mistake I made was buy every cool animal that I like and not <laughs> know what to do with it. And then you end up with 300 geckos and no solid breeding plans. Yeah. I definitely learned that the hard way. And it got to a point where I was like, all right, I'm going to sit down. I had a notebook and I physically wrote out, here's what I want to breed. Here's the animals I need to fill those projects. Now I need to go shop for them and figure out how to do this. Who did you should have uh, done that from the front, but I didn't. Who did you buy some of your kind of core original animals, if you remember from? Um, a lot from all over the place. I got stuff from Crestopia, like Samantha Maddox. I got yep. Dalmatians from her. I mean, her go way, way back. Yep. She's I got awesome. a lot of stuff from Caponetto back in the day. Northern Gecko was big. Um, I'm trying to think of who else was around. Oh, uh, Crown Jewel Reptiles, yep. if you remember her. I don't remember. remember. What was her name? I don't remember her name. I feel like back in the day, it was like businesses with no names to them. Nobody actually cared to put yeah. their personal details on anything. <laughs> I know it was like a status thing back Pre then to be like, media. oh, I don't have a personal name. I'm just the business. And now it's the opposite. It's yeah. like you want to be personal and buy geckos from a, a human. What about like Dragon Town? Did you ever buy any of those reds or anything? <laughs> Dragon Town. Did I get any? I feel like I swapped Dalmatians with Dragon Town. Isn't his name Mike, if I, I think remember? I it was right? Mike, yeah. But he would, Mike, his like whole Mike. thing was those patternless reds. He loved that. Yeah. I remember seeing yeah, a lot Yeah, Mike of had the reds. And I think he worked with Dalmatians. I think I did a swap with him because we were trying to get his, like, bright, bright reds with Dalmatian spots because a lot of the Dals were kind of duller red. Yeah. That was one. Um, I don't know if she's still in. I haven't heard her name come up in a while. Mina Kim, I think She's was not in, but I saw her, like, uh, two years ago. She comes to the Daytona okay. show because she lives in Florida. Does she? So okay. I, uh, I thought she was. California. But. Yeah, she's from Mina's from um, South Florida. So okay. I, her business was the menagerie back in the day. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so her, her and I actually worked pretty closely together back in the day as well. So. Yeah, I remember she had really nice animals back then. Yeah, she had, I'd like to she'd be a fun one to meet and talk. Yeah, old school. It was such a Get funny. Um, you'll appreciate this. But so her and I worked together for years and years and years, but never met. Um, but just, you know, talked on the phone a lot and Facebook and all that stuff. And I'm, I'm vending the Daytona show, I think, in 2021. It would have been 2021. And this little woman walks up to me. She's real short. She's like five foot one. And she's like, D hi, AJ. And I'm like, hello. <laughs> she's like, do you know, do you know who I am? And I said, I think so. And I guessed and I was right. <laughs> And we had a moment to connect and stuff, but it was just like, man, this is weird. I haven't talked to you in like almost 10 years. <laughs> yeah. I had a, a moment like that. If I go off topic, cause it's a great story at the auction at Tinley this past weekend, mm -hmm. I had a, a, just some random girl walk past me in the auction. She stops and goes, I know you. I said, do you? She goes, yeah, I know you. I said, how? She goes, um, she couldn't figure it out. And they did like, it became a joke. I was telling her, like, I'm not going to help you. You gotta, you gotta figure this out in here. And she goes, you vended here last year. I said, no, yeah. I've never been here before. <laughs> so I know you from, from shows in Missouri. I said, guarantee you don't. <laughs> she goes, you breed bolos. No, I don't. That's funny. She so finally, told, I finally told her, you know me, you know me from YouTube probably. And she goes, oh, oh, you're the gecko dude. My boyfriend's going to love to meet you. And she still <laughs> couldn't remember my name. Oh, She's right. like, I don't know who you are. No, my boyfriend wants to meet you. It was hilarious. Oh, that's the best. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. They ended up coming out to dinner with us. We hung out all night. It was a good time. Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. <laughs> so um, focusing, you know, I'm looping back, focusing on kind of your goals with the geckos was something that maybe you struggled with in the beginning. Did you have to undo some of your purchases a few years in and kind of pare down or? Yeah, I, I definitely had to get rid of some animals that I just liked, but they didn't fit in a breeding group. And I had to kind of refocus the whole thing and decide, like, focus on a few things and do them well instead of trying to be a pokemon guy who wants one of everything yeah one of everything's great but yeah. from very early on i was very business oriented i wanted to do this for a living that's not a great business strategy to be a collector who has one of everything that yeah. and it's not going to get you very far did, did so you I, go pretty deep in in terms of like you just bought everything you could or did you slowly build it out and how long did it take you to uh that process of building um, I 
I'd say within the first year, I was at about 150 animals. Okay. Yeah. Wow. At that point, the girlfriend I was with at that time got sick of them, and I got a different apartment <laughs> and a different girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I could do a whole story on just that oh aspect of it. If you want, All right, next podcast yourself. episode. Okay. <laughs> That'll be like, two, a, like a Patreon five, exclusive, so my exes have to pay to get into it. <laughs> um, no, I really focused on, I decided to focus on pinstripes, quad stripes, and Dalmatians, specifically the red spot Dalmatians. Mm. And then I was not going to focus on red pinstripes. I had actually sold, I owe... It's a very sad story. I owe this lady a great deal of gratitude because red pinstripes eventually became what I was known for best, like before mm -hmm. the Azanthic stuff. That's what I built my name on was red harlequins and pinstripes. I'd actually sold my entire red collection to a lady so I could focus on Dalmatians. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was one payment short of completing her payment plan. And I got a message. I'm going to bring the whole podcast to a screech and halt. Oh, I got a message from this lady that said, I have stage four lung cancer oh, i'm not no. going to make it mm -hmm. i want you to keep those animals don't worry about sending my money back i'm so sorry and then i never heard from her again oh wow, wow. and yeah it's yeah. it's one i it's been 12 years and i think about that constantly yeah. because that then those animals founded my i was like all right well that's like mm. You know, if nothing else for this lady, I have to build this project out like she wanted to. Yeah. And that's what I became best known for was red harlequins and pinstripes. And I kind of owe, owe it all to that her. lady a big debt that's of gratitude. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good story. Yeah, it's, it's a terrible, sad story. It's but, sad, you know, but it has a silver lining, I guess. It's kind of, yeah, it's kind of a beautiful a story, actually. Foundational part of how I got to where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. So I guess now, you know, you said you were doing red pinstripes you're doing dalmatians i know you still do dalmatians what would you say if you're going to describe your business to somebody what do you breed now um so obviously the xanthic line has is grown to be by far what i'm known best as mm -hmm. personally the dalmatians are what i like best those are my personal favorites mm. uh the reason for that is that's the one that I've done the most progression on in house. Okay. Like it's pretty easy to buy nice animals, breed them and make nice animals. The Dalmatians are the ones that I can hold up actual geckos and say, I started with this mm -hmm. and now I have this and the change is that's cool. unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. So those, those are the ones that are closest to my heart. And that's really what drives me in this business is that's what I want to do. I don't want to just buy other people's nice animals and sell nice babies. It's the, I don't have a logo sitting here. It's over here. You can't see it. But the, the kind of the catchphrase for my company is quality, refinement, and progression, mm -hmm. because that's how I tried to set it up was buy quality animals, refine the traits, and progress to the next thing. I always want to be trying to make something new, nicer, bring it to the next level. That's the whole point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely have. That's been my personal kind of goal recently, too, is just trying to kind of catch a vision of, like you're talking about, seeing the man in the marble and mm -hmm. trying to carve those things out of thin air. <laughs> That's been something I've been passionate about at least the past couple of years. So, yeah, the Dalmatians are so cool also because they're so there's it's so obvious when you make nicer ones. <laughs> like the progression can be pretty extreme. Yeah, it is. And each shed they get better and better and better. So, that's awesome. Yeah, those ones, I feel like those have made so much progress in the last five or six years mm -hmm. compared to everything else is they've really come a very long way. Do you primarily yeah. like fine. the like light base ones, like the real white base or what, what are some, I know there's red base, there's white, there's yellow, there's, you know, all shades in between. So I have two projects, like two kind of distinct lines is one is as light you light yellow white base with big black spots mm -hmm. is how I'm trying to refine that one to go that way. And then the other project is red spots. And that kind of brings me around to answer a question you said earlier, what have I failed on? I have been trying for 12 years to make a red spotted yellow base Dalmatian. Wow. Hmm. It does, doesn't work. I've got a really? few, like now I have a couple that are like ugly yellow tigers with some red spots, mm -hmm. but 
compared to the amount of progress I've made with red base red spots are now now I've got red base red ink spots and like some insane looking stuff but I never could get those red spots to translate onto a yellow gecko I don't know why it's not like genetically impossible you can get one with a few red spots I don't know if there's something that limits it I just can't maybe I'm just not doing it right I don't know maybe somebody else could do it better maybe it's but maybe that's those the one red project. spots are tied to like red based animals maybe like the, the yeah, host animal the original animal that that started um is just the genetics are strong enough that when you try to outcross it it just doesn't work yeah or there could be you know traits can interact in weird ways like maybe whatever creates the red spots when you breed that with a red base color it amplifies it and you can get more and more red spots but when you do it with other base colors you can't it doesn't have that amplifying effect I don't know. I really don't know what the answer is. I've tried for years and I've never gotten either consistent results or results that are like progressively better over time. That's that's the one that's always kind of stuck in my side is uh, the vision I've had in my head that I couldn't do. That's the one I've kind of failed on. All right. So we'll be watching for those and we'll know that'll be your proudest moment when we see one of those <laughs> or, posted. More It'll likely be... two years from now, somebody else is going to do it and I'm going to be like, <laughs> And you're really? you're gonna be I'm like, what have I been working hard, this hard for this long for? Exactly, I give up. Are you just gonna steal your steal your yellow base? <laughs> yeah, everybody out there now watching is going, ooh, I gotta like, get some red yeah, ones and some yellow ones. I'm gonna show Brian what's up. Have you seen? I'll, yeah, I'll give a, a shout Brian. out. Oh, go ahead, Harry. Oh, just a quick question. Yeah. Um, from the time when you first started your your DALs, your DAL project years ago, um, how long did it take you to get to a point where you were really satisfied with where the DAOs are at. I know you're still refining the, the process in, in, the, in the, uh, the morph, but um, how long did it take you? Yeah, it's that's a hard one to answer because on one hand, I'm never satisfied. Yeah, I yeah. always can see better things. And on the other hand, every time a slightly nicer one hatches out and grows up, I'm like, wow, that's the best one I've ever made. And then yeah, that yeah. feeling lasts about six months until I'm like, oh, I've seen that one before. I can make a better <laughs> yeah. one now. But yeah, I'd yeah. say, like I said, the last five years or so, about five years ago, okay. is I think when I really started seeing like real significant steps in growth yeah. and like how many red spots, the size of the red spots, that really kind of took off. And then the last probably four years with the ink spots, yeah, those are the ones that really come a long ways too. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool to see you guys work on projects long term because as a new breeder you're just trying to throw stuff together and <clears throat> hope, hope things survive but yeah. the long game is just develop, develop things in a way that uh you have a vision for like way out and i think that's awesome seeing you guys do projects like that i think that's pretty cool yeah the long term is definitely that's the harder one to do because you have to have that patience and vision and everything yeah. for it but for sure. yeah and it's it's hard because things you know, trends come in and out of styles. Like when I started working with DALs, they were super hot and you couldn't list a DAL on Pangea forums because it would sell right away. Mm -hmm. And then we went through a long dry period where nobody wanted Dalmatians. They just, they weren't popular unless they were like the best of the best. Nobody was buying them. And I was just like, Dude, I like the red spot. I'm going to keep breeding these. I'm really glad now I didn't yeah. give up yeah. on Did them you breed because they less weren't. of them in those years? Like, did was the project um, smaller, even though you were working it, or did you just go full steam yeah. ahead still? It was definitely, it, it didn't have as much attention and as much, like, real estate space physically with breeding groups as other stuff that was more popular and kind of in vogue. But I never quit doing it. I never quit keeping my nicest holdbacks and trying to make progression that way. Okay. But it was definitely, like, around the time I first got the Azanthic project, you know, a lot of stuff went on the back burner. The Dalmatians were just kind of, they were on maintenance. If I had something nice, I would keep it and hold it back. Mm. I had a whole nother project that completely died because I just didn't have, they didn't physically die. I shouldn't use that word. So the geckos animal. all died, Brian? Is that what you said? The geckos all, try, no. <laughs> the project. You heard it. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> you heard it here. I like the Xanthics better, so the other ones. They all died. No. There's no, they, uh, I, I had a whole project that I just never even tried to develop because I didn't have the space or time or energy for it because I was so focused on all the other stuff. And like red pinstripes have been cut out over the years. I don't breed hardly any. I have a couple groups of like red based drippy dorsal line stuff, mm. but most of my reds, which is weird because that's what I was best known for for years, 
most of my reds have been cut out because like i said i have limited real estate yeah. when i want to keep something something's got to leave i breed yeah. what some... year did you start your exantics oh, sorry. I, I was just sorry, gonna Jay. say i breed some reds too and it's interesting how i feel like the trend like red isn't in right now and yep. it's really weird it because so in theory so like red in most other species is always popular and so yep. it's strange that it's not <laughs> Yeah, I always thought that too, like reds. And I think as a hobby, we've done a pretty poor job of breeding color into lily whites. Yeah. I think that's a lot of why reds died is reds were big for pinstripes and harlequins, but all harlequins aren't very popular anymore because a lily white is essentially just the same visual appearance, but on a much grander scale. Mm. So unless you've got the best of the best tricolors or something, even nice Harlequins aren't very sought after. So reds kind of went that way. Yeah. And then there was this craze to just produce a ton of Lily whites because they were worth a lot of money and they looked real cool. And I don't think many people really focused on quality and progression and let's put red base colors in. Like there are obviously a bunch of them out there, but yeah. I don't, I think the focus was more make a bunch of Lily whites versus make the nicest colored, highest, brightest Lily whites you can. Yeah. So I'm gonna I kind of expect at some point that's gonna come back around and really nice bright colored lily whites yeah. will be in very high demand. I'm shooting for like high color like red and red phantom lily whites and yellow and yellow phantom lily whites this year. <laughs> I'm gonna do a group of those just because nice. I think it's gonna be valuable for combos in the future, right? All these yeah, all these morphs coming down the pipe, you're gonna need those building blocks to be able to work with. So and if you can set those foundation and have those building blocks now, yeah. when you get all those other morphs to make new combos, there's going to be most of the kind of flash in the pan breeders are still going to be, oh, let's make a bunch of this new morph because it's really hot right now. Yeah. And you're already working on let's breed them into reds and all these other things and make the next step. Yeah. Well, they're they're not worried about the next step. They're worried about building that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what so we that's what we were talking about earlier. And Harry had mentioned it or you had mentioned it, Brian, just the patience and the foresight to be like looking for what animal you want to make five years from now what mm -hmm. what animals do i need to make now to make that possible kind of a thing yeah you know? so that's really that's powerful um so i want to kind of shift and talk about just your collection you know just get this out of the way how many animals do you think you have i don't know i don't know how many geckos i have so i won't i, I, I won't ask done. for an exact number but a ballpark <laughs> We'll ask you that first. ballpark right now because of what time of year it is it's really high obviously yeah. it's like peak hatching season for me my seasons usually start a bit later than most people's okay so i'm right like coming down off the crest of peak hatching time yeah. and i'll have consistent hatchlings through the end of november so this time of year i'm probably sitting somewhere between 32 3300 something like that okay and is most of that do you have like separate rooms for breeders versus hatchlings? Is it all kind of in the yeah. same space? I've got five different rooms. One is just breeders. It also has like all my, I call them my personal geckos because they're not really business. It's like my day geckos and I have a handful of lychees and okay. a couple chewy stuff like just stuff that makes me happy. Yeah. That's all in there. And then I have just a couple, three rows of breeder racks. And then I've got, uh, this room actually now has grow outs in it. It used to just be the YouTube setup, oh, and no. I had like workout <laughs> equipment down here because it's growing. I didn't have anywhere else to put it, but now I need more space. So I got geckos in this room. So I have oh, two no. grow out rooms now, and then one more room straight back here that's the baby room. Wow. So, how much? What's the square footage of the basement? Is it massive? About 1200. Oh, that's not massive that's a lot of geckos that's, when i tell people <laughs> how many animals i have in here they're like how the hell do you fit that many i bet it smells basement. really good down there too it's nice yeah it's you know <laughs> once you once you're in here a day or two you don't notice yeah it. you don't know your no your nose <laughs> just gets laundry. desensitized all your hair and your nose gets burned off yeah i always tell people i'm like you know for how many reptiles i have my house doesn't smell that bad like you ever go to someone's house yeah. and you can tell they didn't clean their cat's litter box like you know they have a cat yeah. just when you walk in their house yeah, yeah. that's kind of how my house is like you know i have reptiles you'd never guess there's three thousand of them in here yeah. but you know they're here i feel like that's when i walk in a house and they have like a dirty turtle tank that is the worst 
that that yeah. Yeah, that's like that smell is burned in my mind like a dirty <laughs> readier slider tank yeah <laughs> so as far as feeding geckos at your house what do you think man hours how long do you think it takes to feed the geckos so we do everything in a rotation so each day we do a certain part so okay. it's and then i have uh, one girl that does a lot of feeding and cleaning for me she's here 20 25 hours a week and then i put in just feeding probably 10 and then a lot of my other time is cage cleaning swapping tubs for clean tubs and then photos and websites and shipping and all that other stuff yeah so probably 30 35 hours of just straight feeding okay that makes sense the cleaning is what i'd say the cleaning is the majority of the time for me yeah cleaning is yeah it's <laughs> consistently like we'll switch out we'll have i have basically double as many cages as i need and we'll just go through the breeders and switch all the breeders into fresh tubs as we go through and feed and then i've got a stack of 600 dirty tubs. like yeah. i've always got probably a thousand dirty cages do you have those tubs just up. like stacked behind your house or something where do you put them no there's one portion of the basement that's like a small portion that's unfinished it has like an old workbench and i've got a deep freezer in there mm. and they just all get stacked up in there and then the part where the laundry room used to be now it has a big utility sink and we just slide everything over and one by sit one. at the big sink and it's got one of the big like overhead sprayers you just scrub them out like you're on a dish line at denny's or something yeah. <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> so uh you had said switching over bins do you how what's your labeling system work work like as far as how how are you moving info maybe on that cage to the new cage what's i just have like? tags on each cage is that like a, the, a re-stickable kind of a thing what what is that yeah like? they're just it's just like sticky note tabs like the bookmark style sticky note tabs okay. and they just write the info on there and tape it on the cage and then about once a year like the tape starts to get unsticky and they won't stick anymore. So I just copy it onto a new one and put a new one on there. And... So it's like <laughs> once every year, 18 months or so, I have to redo all the, the stickers, but yeah. it's, it's still easier and cheaper. Cause if I need to move something around or change something, I just throw it away and write a new one in two seconds versus like some sort of more advanced labeling system would be just way more of a pain. It's way easier just to have it all stickers on a tub and I can visually go look at who's in this cage, where'd it come from. Yeah. For the breeders, are you doing, are you a believer in individually housing females? Do you do groups? I know that's kind of like per person, groups. they, you know. Yeah, I do groups. Um, there's a few groups that have three girls per tub, but I think two is more effective. I've cut a lot of the groups down to two girls. Okay. Just from uh, being most able to of manage them, what eggs came from which kind of a thing or? A lot of them, I put light girls together. So I generally know what boy they're from. And then I know what the girl, like an Azanthic project, there's three visual Azanthic girls in there. And then there's a lily white head Azanthic boy. Yeah. So I usually know which boy it came from. But if I don't know exactly which girl, I try to put similar enough girls that essentially it doesn't matter if they look exactly the same. It doesn't really matter which of the two. I know what it is. I know what the genetics are. The girls all match. Yeah. There's a, there's some, obviously that it's parent for parent. I track the info for, if it's a more specific thing. Yeah. Yeah. If it's something like, I call them like celebrity geckos, like everybody loves chunky monkeys or I make sure I track chunky monkeys, babies specifically, or okay. something like that, that I know people want to know. Yeah. Or if it's something that for genetics wise, I want to know exactly what's this one pair going to do. They'll either be housed alone or. Hmm much more closely like that okay and do the males stay in with those females or do you move them like cage to cage like um so they have two cages most groups there's some groups that the males just with three girls or two girls all the time okay. and then most cages they're stacked on top of each other and the male just bounces from one to each other every week okay do you have lids or are you pulling you pulling uh lidless systems? um they're they're lids right now so I, they're all on big shelving units i just oh, pull them man. out and, you're killing yourself uh, over that what do you think <laughs> but it, it's you know i was like i had lidless for a long time and i switched it because the lidless ones weren't the ones i had weren't very space efficient mm. at least some of them i still have some lidless racks but i switched a lot of them out because they weren't space efficient and i have limited real estate yeah and then it was like well the the lidless ones even if I do get it to where I can go all the way to the ceiling, 
I can't put that back in. I don't know if the gecko's jumping out, yeah. if his tail's hanging out and then I catch it. It was like, well, those ones I have to go lit it anyways. I may as well just switch the whole rack over. So you just go floor to, floor to ce- oh, they're on a rack? You don't just go floor to ceiling stacked on the ground? No, they don't. Uh, they I tried that for a bit too, but they got too wobbly. Uh, and it's like, it just, I didn't, wasn't comfortable. That's the last thing I need is something to, they fall over and all the lids pop off. Now I've got 40 geckos <laughs> running around and eggs all over the floor. And, yeah, no thanks. No, I'm just going to put no. racks in. and Yeah. So no, nothing is automated. The misting is all manually one by one. Yeah, I, I stayed away from automation. I thought about okay. the guy that built most of my racks really wanted me yeah. to build in an automated system. And I was like, it just makes me nervous because I don't want to rely on automation. If it fails, my animals aren't going to get water or if it malfunctions, yeah. now my basement floods and yeah. I have to, like, it would be unbelievably nightmarish if this flooded because I've got, you know, 20,000 yeah. pounds of racks and geckos. Like I couldn't take all this out to refinish the basement when it flooded. That would be a nightmare. Yeah. yeah. So I've tried to stay away from anything that could possibly malfunction and give me issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's smart. Yeah. Um, you know, you were um, talking about how you kind of uh, uh, group the animals and what are your, I just want to get your thoughts in terms of like uh, tracking lineage. I know crested geckos, uh, the crested gecko world um, talks a lot about lineage tracking and whatnot, but what, what are your thoughts on it? There's no right or wrong answers. I, I'm just, um, just gonna ask <laughs> I think it can be useful in cases and it's also way overblown in cases. Hmm. I don't, really i i don't subscribe to the theory that i need to get exact photos of every gecko back to great grandparents of where mine came from Mm. i'm much more like okay look at it what morph is it that's what i'm going to breed it for lineage can be helpful if you think there's other things going on or recessive traits or something you're trying to uncover but i've I've always kind of chalked it up to crested geckos are much more their pets before they're reptiles like crested gecko people tend not to be reptile people they're gecko people Hmm. and we don't really operate the way the rest of the reptile world works like if you went to a ball python breeder and asked him for that that azanthic het pied ball python and then told them i won't buy it unless i get exact parent photos they would just laugh at you and sell it to someone else because why do you need to see the parents i told you what the parents are that's what the genetics are that's it would be a ridiculous question for any other species but crested geckos but there are cases where we have so much to learn about the genetics that it does help to know that info sometimes yeah. but i'm not a i'm not a guy that like i need to know it for every single animal back all these generations you, or i'm not going to buy it for it's a little not bit here or whatever like i think it gets a little bit fanatical yeah. so so it's yeah. a tool essentially it's a tool you should you. use gotcha gotcha yeah for sure and then um um you know there's a report uh the <clears throat> the foundational genetics that came out uh it came out i think just last week right just before so, tinley yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. what are your thoughts on that how helpful is that <clears throat> for the um, hobby and just your general thoughts on it i so i haven't read it in depth yet i was talking with a bunch of people about it, especially tom about it in tinley yeah. And uh, he was giving me a lot of the information and what was in it, but I haven't actually sat down and read the whole thing yet. I'm very excited to. I think that's an approach that is long, long overdue in the gecko world. You know, AJ will remember the days when it was really popular to go on the Pangea forums and say, oh, breeding geckos is like you pair two apples together and a chipmunk comes out. Yeah. Like, that's not how it works. And that was the prevailing knowledge for years and years was it's just totally random and it's all polygenic and all this. It's like, that's Mm -hmm. not really how it works. We just didn't have all the info. Yeah. So I think that project's very important and I think that's going to help a lot of people. And I think honestly, it's way, way overdue. I'm really glad that they're Mm -hmm. putting that info out there and putting it all together in one, one place where you can reference everything instead of trying to piece together. Can you imagine trying to get all that info on Facebook? Good luck. Oh man, that's where all the best info comes from. Just just search in a Facebook group and they'll find all the right answers. Don't even search it. Just post it as a question and you'll get yeah. nice, concise, focused, polite responses. Yeah, that's how that's how it works, right? <laughs> Everybody's very polite and very sweet. And everyone's an expert. That's the best part is all the experts are oh, yeah. <laughs> well, they don't let them in if they're not. Yeah, that's I mean, true. Obviously. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, as we kind of, you, you guys are uh, kind of at the forefront of um, the crested gecko hobby, 
and you've guys seen how these guys these things have progressed um how exciting is it for both of you guys i guess in terms of how things are progressing all these morphs that are popping out and our understanding of how to um pair things and create things has it been uh positive in both of you guys' uh um thoughts and opinions uh I'll you yeah i'll say time. um yeah i'd say that i'm i've never been more excited to breed geckos than i am right now i think wow. that okay with everything cool. that is going on you know we're going to talk about it a little bit later but like xanthix and caps mm. and fraps and sable and empty backs and all this different stuff that's going on i think this is the yeah. best time this is the best time you could ever breed geckos in it's the most exciting time every every new day awesome. is the most exciting time to do this because cooler and cooler animals are being made every day so yeah 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 i agree it's it, i think the next five years are going to be absolutely fascinating to see it's awesome hmm. yeah you know it's like think of the last five years five years ago like one ugly kind of brownish grayish azanthic was mind-blowing and then i mean look at stuff like this we have now yeah. Yeah. What are we going to have in another five years? Like that was yeah. one sure. gene that kind of stepped in and changed a whole bunch of stuff. There's four or five of those floating around right now. Yeah. Mm. It's going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun. Next five years, seven years, it's going to be a real interesting ride. Yeah. That's good. I mean, that, that kind of, uh, uh moves into how we, how, how do you, Brian, see, um, the hobby from a market standpoint? Um, you know, we have all these exciting genes coming in. Do you see the hobby growing significantly? Um, what is your take on it? I think uh, market-wise, I think it's going to fall a little bit just because it's been it's the growth has been so exponential the last few years. There's just not that big a market at this high a level to sustain mm -hmm. it forever. But I don't think it's going to be like a giant collapse. I don't think it's yeah going to get back to where it was ten years ago when you're trying to pedal. $75 geckos on Pangea forums. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's going to be strong. It's going to be a good market. There's going to be a lot of room for a lot of people to come in and have fun playing with a lot of different animals. I think there it's a big, strong market. I think the top yeah. top end is going to come back down to earth, but the bulk middle part of the market where most people operate, I think is going to get, is going to remain very strong for and probably another decade or so like eventually it's going to fall everything does corn snakes did leopard mm. geckos have mm. yeah. even ball pythons aren't what they were 15 20 years ago it's yeah, going to regress yeah. some but it's got it's got legs for quite a while i think yeah um in terms of just the the you know the the number of breeders coming in and um you know hobbyists coming in do you see that growing um yeah i do i think i think i've you know i've kind of noticed that the last five years that there's been a bit less complaining about oh how saturated the market is and mm. and this and that it's it's going to be the same story it's been forever where there's a lot of like flash in the pan breeders that come in and make a lot of noise but yeah you know they're not doing what we were talking about where you're looking at building those steps they come in and go i want to breed a bunch of lily whites and then they do <laughs> And then realize they've kind of been left behind by people who are doing more than just trying to crank out a thousand lily whites a year. Yeah. Those people are going to come and go like they always do. The people that show up and kind of breed for fun, which that's not a bad thing at all. Those people are integral. Yeah. Like the hobby doesn't exist without them. Like those are, I think, the people that are the driving force is there's a million of them and most of them come and then leave. But the ones that stay are what make up that bulk part we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And I think that lower part is just going to continue to grow and get bigger and bigger. That's what do you cool. think about, yeah. so your mention of like lily whites where you get these flash in the pan breeders that just kind of hop in and are like, all right, I'm doing this. I'm going to breed a million of these things. Do you think that's happening? Um, obviously I think that's happening with cappuccinos with people kind of searching for Petco caps and stuff. Do you see yeah. that also happening with Xanthix? Cause I see a lot of Xanthix uh starting to be popped right now um from people that don't really have a lot of other things going on <laughs> and i, I yeah, won't make you, i um, won't make you uh bad mouth any of your own customers but i'm just curious <laughs> well first of all i love all of them dearly yes and we do we love we'll them all more available soon. please call me 
What's your phone um, number again? No. <laughs> <laughs> I get too many calls yeah. already. The ones who can buy them know who they are. Give yeah, me a call. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. Um, I do think that market's going to fall, mm. but it's it's recessive. I'm though, trying too. to think. So it's, how got to, more, it's got more. It's going steps. to be different. Yeah. I've I I tried very hard to specifically. Oh, so I've got a good analogy. I'll give you. I based the business model of how I started selling Azanthix when the first one, when I started releasing the first ones, I based the whole thing off. I don't even remember the guy's name, but it was a guy that had the original Palmetto corn, corn snake. Okay. It was a wild caught animal. He got it, he bred it. And then he, for some reason, I'm very thankful for it, decided it was a great business move to publish his entire business plan. Here's how I'm going to breed them, how I'm going to sell them. And his whole goal was, I don't want this to be another corn snake morph that sells for a ton of money and then tanks. Mm. And he published this whole plan on how he was going to address that. So it was a strong long-term market. It's been fantastic. I saw Palmetto corns at Tinley for 500 bucks. That was like 12 years ago. Those things came out at four grand. So give us the, corn give us the cliff notes. Give us the cliff notes of that plan. It was basically don't overbreed. Don't try and just cash in for a million dollars right now. Cause you know, figuratively, because you can, it's breed slow. Don't breed for numbers, breed for quality, progression, make nicer and nicer animals, different combos and um, release female heavy updates yeah. to try and limit the production in the market. Because if you flood the market with a bunch of boys, somebody's gonna breed those to a hundred females and then they're gonna do the crash that you're trying to avoid. So I've tried very hard for, what's it been, yeah. almost 10 years now with the Azanthix yeah. to create a market where it's okay. strong for everybody, not just good for me for a few years and then everybody loses. Like I, I never yeah. wanted that to be the case. So did you, That's the cool. first few years, did you just have a room full of Xanthic males just sitting in tubs? <laughs> uh, Xanthic, pet Xanthic males? I absolutely did. I had a whole raft <laughs> of Xanthic males that I'm like... I see you're running a I special mean, on the website for those, right? <laughs> yeah, now now it's at the point where you can't give them away. There's so many out oh, there, but uh, for yeah, for years it was like I had so many that just sat in racks and got fat because I'm like I'm I'm not gonna breed you, but I don't yeah. want all forty of you out there for someone else yeah. to start racking up numbers with because that's gonna kill the market. So they yeah. they hung out and just got fat and happy yeah, for a while. To live their that's best awesome. life over at your house. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Sorry, cool. Harry, um, I got hijacked. No, your, no, your no, you get. No, you know, I was uh, thinking. You know, in terms of, you know, you have um, pretty strong ties with Korea, um, Brian. Um, I think a lot of a lot of big breeders do, actually. But what yeah. is your what are your what are your thoughts in terms of the forecast of the global market in Korea, in Europe, in China? What is your your take on uh, the hobby? Um, Korea is going to soften. It already has for most morphs other than Azanthix at this point. Okay. Like cry colors were huge there for a while. Those are hard sell yep. now. Dalmatians mm -hmm. are still somewhat in demand but that market's definitely they're going to start supplying themselves at this point instead of getting everything from us mm -hmm. yeah i think europe's going to build back up because for years like doing a every three month export to the ham show in germany was a big deal and now almost nothing i don't ship anything to europe hardly mm -hmm. so I, I expect that market will pick back up when they won't have to compete with the prices coming out of korea and they can kind of say okay well now that those prices died here's what we're willing to pay i think that market will kick back up and um yeah I, I know china is like shanghai and taiwan i've shipped exports to both of those places and i've been here i actually met at tinley two exporters that i was introduced to just they don't even yeah, have it set well. up yet did you meet them as well yeah i was told they're like we're not even importing now yeah. but we will be importing high-end geckos we wanted to meet you and yada yada so i expect that market will probably get a lot stronger too yeah i had heard that in mainland china still with covid regulations it's you can't you can't technically ship to mainland china you have to go to hong kong first so. yes i've i've things are going to mainland china yes I'll leave it yeah. at that. Yep. <laughs> We're getting there. I just, I just ship but, them to the exporter on this side. But, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like I, I've had stuff care. go to, to Hong Kong and Taiwan and it all, I've been told it all ends up in mainland China, just not exactly legally at the moment, yeah. but that's what these guys were doing at Tinley was like, Hey, we know the day's coming when we can open that up yeah. again. We wanted to come meet all the breeders like you. That's really exciting. 
That's really exciting. I think that so. Market's I mean, that's going to open up in a more um, legal way, which is good. Yeah, um, and I mean, legal legal means more customers because not everybody's going to want to get their stuff scraped out the bottom of a cargo ship hidden under some boxes. Yeah. When it shows up nicely from a nice importer legally with paperwork at your house, that brings a lot of interested people in that aren't scared anymore. Yeah. Like, and, you know, China's yeah. freaking huge. Can you imagine what the Korean market did for all of us? Can you yeah. imagine if mainland China has anything even remotely close to that? That'll yeah. keep this whole ship afloat for another 10 years by itself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it, do you think, it, you know, bringing it into China, you'll spike everything, but eventually everything will be saturated. So it's going to crash out <laughs> in a couple of decades. Yeah. I mean, it, that's, it's, it always will inevitable it, regardless. These things but, produce a lot of eggs. So yeah, yeah. it's, it's yeah. inevitable, but there's enough demand and they're easy enough to care for. And there's enough yeah. markets out there that I think are going to want them. Cool. It's going to remain yeah. pretty strong. Cool. So I'm going to ask you That's a little good. bit of a, a little bit of a rapid fire. So we won't do, we won't talk too long about each of these things, but all right. Um, we're, I'm just going to ask you kind of where you think things are going on these different mores. So things that are currently right. hot traits that I think are the most popular animals, and where you see like, is this heading in the right direction or the wrong direction? Kind of. Thing. Okay. <laughs> exanthic and exanthic lily white. Uh, I think they're going to have a slow, slow decline. They're going to stay really popular. Um, and they're they're just like prices and demand, I think, are going to stay strong for several more years. Cool. They're going to start to come down. I really think, I've said this for five straight years, I think this is the year prices start to drop instead of go up. Yeah. I've been wrong the last five years, but I can't imagine <laughs> that it goes up even further. It's, it's still pretty high, Brian. We want to see, start we to see him hit 50K. Yeah. That's what we want to see. <laughs> well, Lily White is Anthic sold at Tinley for 45. I know, so I, saw yeah, we saw I saw that. it. That's crazy. We're yeah, almost yeah, there. Yeah, right? We're on our, yeah, we're still yeah, on The up. next one I sell, I'll put it up for 50 and we'll just see what happens. Yeah. Maybe we'll make it. Let's do it. You can buy yourself a new car. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. Yeah. Car, oh, really? What, what did you get? <laughs> you going to tell us? I bought a, do I have my phone? I'll show you a picture of it because I'm in Yeah, involved. we want to see it. I've been casually shopping job? for a while and I set a price and I said, if I can find one under this price, I'll buy it. And I finally did. So between you and me, cause nobody else is watching. I picked up a <laughs> Shelby GT 350 oh, yes. R. Yeah. That's awesome, man. It's that's an, beautiful. it's an older one. It's like six years old. So it's definitely not yeah. like the new ones are nice, but they're $120,000 cars. This one's nowhere near that. Yeah, so I, no, that's beautiful. I had to go with an older one with a replaced motor because the guy blew the engine up. Nice. But that's how I got it down into a reasonable price range. So did you check to see how many gecko boxes you can drive to FedEx in it? Well, they, they <laughs> it's the R version, so they actually take the back seats well, out. That's so good. I technically have more storage in the back seats than I would have otherwise. So it's basic Plus, I can't put my kids in it, so they can't take up space. Yeah, that's true. So it's basically a transit <laughs> van that's very fast. I'm going to put, yeah, it's, 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 it's a tax write off. I'm going to put a logo on the side and after black Friday, it's my goal to fit every black Friday shipment in that car and take it. To FedEx. There's no way that's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Hook, I like want to see you put a hitch on it and put a trailer on the back of it. Oh yeah. You could probably tow something with that. With all Just that drive, yeah, drive it to shows. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. That would be so <laughs> funny. That's awesome. That's okay. Beautiful. I'm back. Uh, caps, super caps and fraps. I think that one's going to be rough. Okay. I think, I think fraps will be the best. They're going to fare the best mm -hmm. just because there's so much potential work to be done with different base colors and expressions in the high pattern, low pattern, but super caps, I think people are going to be scared off of now and caps, I think are going to absolutely plummet. There's so, so many of those being produced right now. I think that's going to, Unfortunately, I think those are going to just tank and so absolutely tank. Do you regret your buying decision? Regrets a strong <laughs> word. Do you? I don't know what's uh, a what's a synonym that's less I, strong. I'll, I'll put it this way: I don't expect that that will end up being my best business move ever. I don't regret buying them because I do want to work with yeah. them and I have plans for them that I'm excited about. But buying them when I did at the prices I did, I don't expect is going to be a move i'll look back on in 10 years and go you nailed it man you nailed it right there. 
<laughs> well, you just got to use all the views you make off of the, the TikToks, and uh, that'll pay back the decision, <laughs> right? You know. <laughs> I, I am a, an official. I've been bragging to my younger friends, like the girl that runs my social media. She's 21, and I've been teasing her. I was like, you know, I've been adopted by your people. I'm an official, a Gen Z, honorary <laughs> Gen Z member now because I, I am a paid TikTok creator. Wow. I've awesome. made... Uh, last time I checked about two weeks ago, $9.11 over the last three months. So you, know. so you could go get yourself a Chipotle burrito and a cup of water and, you know, treat, could, treat yourself. Could, yeah. That'd be good. I could get a, a burrito if I cash in some of my Chipotle points to bring it down to the right price. And I would have to get a cup of water. The thing is, you couldn't get Maybe any guac. Eliminate they don't notice, you could not get guac, it. for sure. That's... No, definitely not. I, like I, mean, I could go to Qdoba because they give it to you free. But is it worth going it's to Qdoba just for free guac? Not I don't think good. it is. No. I don't think it is. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Uh, empty back. <laughs> empty back slash super stripe. You know what people... Debate is out on how different those two things are, but they're not really different. So I, I kind of regret the empty back name now because it's mm. gotten so much traction. I should have just stuck with Super Stripe. Yeah. Um, empty back was just like my vision was to get Super Stripes and make the back Rider. as empty and wide as possible. And now it's just the name's kind of taken on a name of its own. But essentially, it's the same thing. It's just empty mm. back is my personal super stipe project if that makes sense okay hmm. so but in if uh, when i was reading foundation genetics they'd say they're not the same thing i'll have to read it i'll have to read they it. would claim See, that's why i kind of regret coming up with the name because now there's people with lines they're calling empty backs that aren't related to what yeah, i was working but with they look like and them. they're saying it's something different so i i feel like i just put a name out there going oh this is a fun name for my version of that project yeah. and it grew into something else that may have happened anyways with just whatever name I'd be interested but, to see. Yeah, you should read, and we'll talk. I, you know, because the super stripe animals, you basically took super stripes, right, and you bred them to be mm -hmm. wider and wider in their displacement of color in the center of of the pinstripe scales in the dorsal. Yeah. So that's just so, that's and that's, how you would say you, you created them. Yeah, that was my whole goal for that project was those super stripes are cool. Again, I don't want to just buy nice super stripes and make nice ones. What can I do with that? Yeah. And I thought, oh, if I get it to where it's so wide that just the crests are highlighted, that would be a cool look. Mm. And I called it my empty back project. So for, right. for from, you know, I can only speak to what happens in-house here. That's what empty back was. Yeah. So where do you think empty back's going? Do you think we've fully tapped into that or is it kind of just the start? I think that one's actually got room to grow. I don't know if it's going to grow because I don't, I think base color, base color, like red and orange and yellow empty back and super stripes. There's a ton of potential yep. there, but I don't know that anybody's going to do it because like we talked about earlier, reds and just normal base colors aren't all that popular because lily whites and azanthics are so much flashier and more popular right now. So I think that's one that maybe when other things kind of fall out of vogue, somebody might go, Oh, I can do this. And those will kind of rise back up. Yeah. I don't know that that's going to happen anytime soon, just because I don't know that anybody's really going to put in that work right now. I'm going to do it. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I knew you're going to be like, I got well, you. I'm, you got I'm already things. geared up to do it. So I think he's working I've on already it. been uh, planning. I know you do. And then who is the other girl? I think her name's Hannah. That Greeks. does really nice super streaks. Yeah. Greek gecko. She's got really nice yellow base super stripes. I'm trying so I'm to buy one of those. That. Cause I think it would nice. do a lot of benefit to what I'm working towards. So. Yeah. Like so I think there's a lot of room there for some people to get in on that angle yeah. and, and keep those going pretty strong. Yeah. And the, I'm curious just because I've never seen it. Have you ever tried to produce Lily white empty back animals? I haven't. Huh? I haven't. I've most of my, so when I got Lily whites, I was very late to getting Lily whites. Mm. And then when I did get them, everything went into the Azanthic project. So I just, uh, like the last two years, started producing just Lily Whites for myself. Mm -hmm. And the only real refinement I've tried to go towards towards those is I've learned breeding them to like white stripe, white spot, drippy dorsal, tricolors, like that kind of stuff mm -hmm. is good for really, really high pattern Lily Whites. And then I've got a bunch of groups aiming on red base color Lily Whites. Mm -hmm. And that's about all I've really done with them yet so far. So you kept some reds back <laughs> yeah like that's where the that's red where the drippy dorsal project ended up going is now those are all getting mixed with lily whites cool. all right new ones sable what do you think about sable i 
that's the one that has me looking around my breeder room going, well, what can I cut out? Cause I don't have any space. <laughs> That's awesome. And I, I know very little about the sables, but the little I do know and the things I've seen, I find them wildly fascinating. Mm. I think that's very exciting project. And out of everything, that's the one that I'm like, I don't know what I, what could I cut out to get space for 20 breeders to try and put together a good sable project. Just cut the caps out, right? <laughs> that's all I honestly I've thought super about that. I'm, like, I'm super so self. invested. I got so much money in those. I'm going to lose it. I'll try to sell them now. So I kind of yeah. got to try and recoup some of that because it was such a big investment. Yeah. But that, yeah, that's what needs to get cut out for sables. But I'm like, I'm going to lose my ass on caps and then try and spend <laughs> what they're charging for sables and super sables. Oh, my your God. sables just, will make it back for you. Don't worry. Yeah, I'm like, I sh shouldn't have bought that car. I should have bought some sables. I, can... I I've been thinking personally, like I'm good. <laughs> I'm going to work cap a little bit as well, but I think Sable, in my opinion, um, maybe unpopular. I think Sable is just cooler cappuccino, in my personal opinion. And it wasn't sold yeah. at Petco's and PetSmart, so it shouldn't flood nearly as quick. Yeah, Sable's going to have much longer legs on it. It's going to be a much light. better investment style. Yeah. And yeah, the cap one's going to kind of bite me. I'm still going to have fun with them. I got ideas. And I was really mad because my main plan was super Dalmatian, super caps. And now I'm like, I don't really want to be producing a bunch of super caps anymore. So how come? I'm like, well, how... What's the reasoning behind that? No, I'm kidding. I'm just being a smart <laughs> I wonder. ass over it. <laughs> no, Are all I've your animals still doing well, by the way? On a, a lighter note? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. My, I've got a, a handful of super caps. I haven't had any of the eye issues that people have been talking about. I haven't seen that in any of mine, but they're definitely like just watching them grow. They don't get as like full and robust and big as they should. Hmm. You know, it's just getting to the point where you work with them enough and look at them and you're just like, it's just, just not quite right. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm not super comfortable. Like Breeding they're them. good enough that I would breed the super caps to other things but I'm not super comfortable being like, all right, now I'm going to try and hatch a hundred super caps next year. And no, um, yeah, just doesn't feel good doing that. So I'm going to focus on like cappuccino combos. Okay. What kind of combos are you going to do? I really want to do, um, high pattern coverage, Lily white or frappuccinos. They would be mm. like, see, cause a lot of them that have been bred or just breed them to whatever Lily white I have. That's up to age to make fraps. Cause yeah. that's what's hot. I want to focus on high pattern coverage frappuccinos and see because the frappuccino, the cappuccino gene takes a lot of that back out. Mm. But what happens when you get like a nearly fully patterned lily white mixed into that? I think it could be fun. I think yeah. there's some room there for my own curiosity. Yeah. I, I do worry about a little bit just, I don't think people are going to own as many caps and fraps as they do lily whites. I think it'll yeah. be like, you'll have some and there'll be real like showstopper animals, but I don't think it's going to be like people are going to have a whole collection of them. Yeah. That's that's Yeah. That market's not going to go all that great. And there, I mean, there's still people, I think it's ridiculous, but there's still people out there that refuse to own a Lily white because the super form has issues. Hmm. They're like, yeah. you know, there's those people like How they actually they have caps? more of a point to have that feeling about caps and super caps than they do Lily whites. It's just kind of ridiculous. That's crazy. So it's, yeah, I don't think it's going to be that great of a market, honestly. All right. Speed round. Tricolors, high whites. We'll, lo we'll, uh, we'll lump those together, like high white animals that maybe aren't tricolors and, uh, and tricolors themselves. What do you think about that? I think those are going to be similar to Azanthics. I don't know if there's a lot of room for like vast improvement with them, but I think the market's pretty strong and okay. it'll be a slow plateau fall. Super Dows. Cool. What about Super Dows? I think the super doll market's going to keep going pretty strong. There's still room for improvement. I'm still hatching new dolls that are nicer and nicer than what I had the years before. I'm still crossing my dumb fingers that I can get red spots on a yellow gecko. We believe in you. <laughs> you got it. You got it. Right. I'm going to keep trying. But I, yeah, I think that one's going to stay pretty strong. Cool. All right. So business strategy for the future. What does altitude exotics look like? five years from now or 10 years from now, as far as your long-term goals. I know I, I'm a little bit of a long-term guy. I think you are too. So what's that? Yeah. You probably have it down on a notepad somewhere as much as you will divulge. What is kind of your long-term goal as far as the company? 
I do. I actually sketched it. I made a painting. I'm great with watercolors. It's me <laughs> curled up on the floor crying, going, "Why did I spend so much money on those caps?" <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna ma- we're gonna make a clip out of that. Clip it, clip it. That's gonna I, be a YouTube <laughs> short. Yeah. Does that? Oh, there, Brian. Brian. <laughs> there it is. No, I'm oh, I'm. Uh, I have some <laughs> plans that I don't want to talk about yet. Mm. Any you I will. have. Uh, I do. trying to decide if i want to tell you i have a a plan that i'm going to launch very soon it's gecko related but not animal we could do it here so i've had for a a long time an idea to um, i have another website that's almost done and it'll launch early november okay and it's a merch based website but it's Mm. based on giving away geckos so it's Mm. a whole line of merch most of it has altitude exotic themed, but then I'm going to put in other designs and whatnot. And then my, my basic idea is every three months, there'll be a new gecko up for giveaway. So you, it'll be like a really nice cappuccino or a head Xanthic or a really nice Dalmatian. And along with that gecko will be an exclusive t-shirt. And I've got a whole bunch of designs. Mm. So they'll be like, you can buy any of the merch or there's only a hundred of this one t-shirt available. After a hundred, I never sell them again. That's so cool. it's like a collectible T-shirt, and then every time you buy something, you get entered to win the gecko for free. Cool. And then when the, cool. yeah. the end date comes up, everybody that made a merch purchase, I draw a name out of the hat. That person gets the free gecko, and then nice. there's another gecko to give away with another exclusive limited run T-shirt to kind of make it like a collectible yeah. thing. That's really cool. I'm having other artists do the shirts. I've got a whole bunch of designs made up. That I'm gonna start with a Christmas themed one. Nice. That one girl that was charging you 800 bucks. That design's got to be pretty good. (laughs) (laughs) I can't wait to see that limited release. (laughs) You saw that. That post wasn't up for very long. You're quick. (laughs) Um, When when does that go live again, Brian? November. I don't have an exact date yet, but it's. I want to get it up by the middle of November, maybe early November, if I get everything sorted and settled. Cool. In time, that's cool. I really so, like and then that. I'm, I've, oh, got, I've got a friend making a really nice uh, Christmas themed gecko shirt. So the first giveaway is going to be like a limited run Christmas themed gecko t shirt. And then, like I said, there's a whole other line of merch on there that any any purchase. It's basically every dollar you spend is one entry to win the gecko. Nice, nice. That's so awesome. what uh, yeah. what's going to be the buy price on the t shirt? Um, it'll be around. I, think I have to. I'm sick. I actually have it right here. It is literally my other page on my website is my merch site that I'm building. Uh, thirty nine ninety five is the base price. Nice. That'll be the limited edition shirts, and then there's other shirts and hoodies everywhere. From I think the cheapest shirts like nineteen bucks and goes up to fifty for a hoodie. And nice. I got mugs and cups and backpacks and all kinds of cool stuff. Cool. You're going to be uh, all over, awesome. all over everywhere. People are going to be like, why is this guy dressed head to toe in gecko merch? That's the guy carrying his free gecko he won around. <laughs> the guy who wins has got to post a photo of him wearing every item he wore or he bought to win the animal. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I, I told one, one girl at the show in uh, Vegas that I did kind of briefly about the idea and she was like, oh, that's a great idea. I wouldn't even wear the shirts. I'm just going to like fold them so you can see the design and hang them in shadow boxes on the wall. It's like, that's huh. kind of a neat idea, actually. Yep. Could add the shadow box to the uh, to the website. <laughs> it, I do, I do have some actually These pictures you can buy on a canvas print in a shadow box. Oh, that's cool. And there's like seven of them. So you could get like a whole row of like detail. They're like detailed different parts of Gecko's photos. Nice. That's awesome. Nice. Yeah. Those, those are on there for so sure. So what's that site called? Are you going to tell us? Um, I can't tell you yet because it's not, it is a live website, oh, okay. but so. it's not, uh, it's not ready to go. So okay. if people go there and start buying merch, I'm like, oh. Okay. Great, so I'm going to start Googling to be open and here. I'll try to find it. No. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. If you do, let me know so I can turn okay, it off. Okay. Sounds good. No, hopefully, hopefully soon I'll have it up and ready to launch. Cool. So I think you had already answered this. This is my last question, I guess, for you, um, Brian. But you had said with Sable, it's like, man, how am I going to do this? I don't have any space. Are you maintaining at this point with the collection size? Or do you have any plans to grow it in the future? I don't have any plans to get any bigger than I am. 
I'm already, I'm at a point where I can hatch more animals than I can grow up. Mm-hmm. And I like to grow. That's why there's now racks in this room is I need more grow out space. Mm-hmm. And I like to grow everything up. I don't want to sell. I've done this before where I sell babies and then regret it later. I was like, oh, that one's better than the one I kept to breed. Mm-hmm. I like to grow them up and pick out what do I want to keep. And that's a huge part of the fun of this for me is to watch them develop. Even if I'm not going to keep them, yeah. it's way more fun for me to watch them grow. And what do they turn into? And what does that tell me about yeah. my pairings and what I can change to get better results? Mm-hmm. So if I get more breeders, I'm already overflowing with hatchlings and, and growing everything up and all that. I can't really add. I would have to redo the whole thing and completely move somewhere else. And you have to move doing it would be a massive, <laughs> probably. Yeah, it would be, it would be a massive undertaking that I'm like, I just don't need that. I'm already yeah. max capacity, max work ethic, max like, I'm good. Cool. I'm I'm happy with yeah. that. So you you wouldn't um, you wouldn't ever become like a giant machine. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, with hundreds of employees and no, I don't no, think I, it's I, all I, that many guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, five employees. Yeah. <laughs> employees. No, I, I, I kind of tiptoed down that road for a long time. I did wholesale work for PetSmart or Petco, okay. I think is where most of mine ended up. Yeah. And when I first got into it, the money was pretty good. And that was a big driving factor. It was like, oh, all these, you know, even with nice pairings, if you get something that's not so nice, it's a good outlet for it. Mm. And then it got to the point where the pricing was so competitive, hmm. there wasn't enough room for profit. Like the profit margin was so small. I was hatching 5,000 geckos a year out of this basement. It was just crammed in here and they were all just, you know, it was like a third of it was high end stuff and two thirds was all just going to Petco as soon as they were old enough to ship. And I got to a point where I'm like, I'm not even making money doing this to make money. I need to be hatching 20, 30,000 a year. And that would mean I'd have to move to a much bigger facility and all these, it was this whole process. And I just had a revelation that like, this isn't fun anymore. Mm. It's not fun to breed 5,000 geckos and, and at four weeks old, ship them off to Petco. Yeah. It's a, that's not why I got into this. Yeah. And it's not, it's, it's not why I got into this because I like making living art. Yeah. Yeah. Not, I like to mass produce animals to sell to Petco. So I, I just liquidated the whole wholesale side. That was my whole Black Friday sale one year was all of those animals <laughs> cut that whole side of the business out. And it's not, not any fun. I don't want to do it. I think you went yeah. in the right direction. You made the right choice. I think so too. <laughs> I do. It was, you know, you get much better results when you're doing what you love, not doing what pays the bills. Totally. Yeah, that's cool. Um, Brian, you know, talking a little bit about um, the community, the, the gecko community and kind of, I know you've been doing a lot of things, um, you know, privately um, for years. And I, I forgot where I heard you say, but um, you just started coming out to shows uh, this past year, right? Yeah. Um, is there a reason for that? Uh, what is, are, are you trying to be more um, engaged within the community or what's your, what is your driving force yeah. behind that? Um, so there's kind of two faces to that. One is for business and one is personal on the personal yeah. side. I've spent 12 years in this basement playing with lizards by myself. Like, yeah, I, I, I am, I'm very introverted. And I was like, I just, I don't want to be like this anymore. I want to meet people. Mm-hmm. I want to have fun. I want to go to these shows. I want to interact. I want to be part of the group. You know, I'm not part in, in many ways. I'm not part of the community. I'm a very big name next to the community that a lot of those people interact with. Mm-hmm. And I don't really want to be like that anymore. I want to be part of the circle. And I can't do that if I don't actually know anybody or talk to anybody or meet people. So I wanted yeah. to address that side of it. So I figured I'd start going to shows and yeah, that's cool. Some people. Was it was your first show vending? Was it Vegas? Yeah, that was the first show I'd vended in like almost seven years. I used to wow. do like our local Denver shows every now and then. And I've done the old, old Vegas show like a decade ago I did. And I, I've done a couple in Kansas City, but that was you know, a decade ago, I hadn't, I hadn't even been to a show as a customer, much less vended yeah. one in almost seven years. Yeah, I gotcha. Um, and so, you know, as you try to make connections with other breeders and the community going to shows, um, are you looking to do not necessarily like animal collabs, but, you know, collabs with working with um, other, you know, I, um, yeah, other breeders and just trying to make those connections? What does that look like for you? moving? Yeah, forward? it does. I, I want to do... 
I always have ideas for video series, stuff like this that I'd love to do with other breeders. I've never had the time to get my own ideas off the ground. So I love doing stuff like this with you guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've talked to um, Gabby, at the Morph Menagerie we talked recently. I'm going to um, go up and do the Flora and Fauna show and conference nice. and awesome, be a part of that this year. We just talked about that. I assume it's okay for me to say that if it's You're not. Fine. Sorry, Gabby. I, uh, Gabby and I, <laughs> co uh run the show so i was I, gonna say you're you're a big part of yeah, it so i assume she talks to I, you about I it. do yeah, like 10 percent, and gabby does 90 percent. so it's... well we had talked on tuesday <laughs> actually this week we talked and i told her i'm like yeah i'd, I'd love to come as That's a cool. customer yeah. if nothing else maybe to vend if it makes sense for me at that point mm -hmm. and then maybe to do some sort of uh like a presentation or one of the seminar type things yeah. if there's a spot yeah. that i think i could be useful so I think we have an idea figured out nice. that I can go be a part of that, which I think is pretty exciting. Well, that'll be good. That yeah, will man, be dude. the, if you want to meet people in the hobby and you want to kind of plug in, that is the event to go to because that's it's very like, intimate. Uh, it sounds like... You're not going to be overrun by people. Um, yeah. And there's really time to be able to spend at booths and get to hear about people's projects and, kind of what they have going on and get to know the people more personally. So that was kind of our goal yeah. with it was to make this event that's unique. That's not just, Oh my gosh, I can't hear anything. It's so loud in here. I can't talk to anybody. It's like, we're going to, well, you can walk around with a glass of wine and eat some appetizers and talk to people and get to know yeah. your favorite breeders and kind of what they have going on. So we're excited to have. Yeah. You. That's, that's what I'm excited for is it's like, even at Tinley, I wanted a lot of that at Tinley, but I didn't really get to talk to you or Gabby or Donna was there. I spent some time talking to her, but like I went out for a dinner after the show with there's 15 people there and I still, there was 30 more that I want to be able to sit down and have dinner with and talk to. And it'd be great to have like that weekend where that's the focus of it. Yeah rather than a show with 20,000 people yeah. you're running around like crazy <laughs> that'll be the perfect event for yeah. you to do that so i think that's yeah. a good i think one. i'm excited for that i think that's going to be fun yeah that's awesome that's cool and and you don't have to answer this if you don't want brian might maybe it's too personal but w was there anything specific that kind of just spiked your interest in jumping into the community and making the connections um what was what's different from the last uh, few years versus now um was there like a revelation of some sort? Not really a revelation. It was more of me just. Oh, yeah, I can answer that, but it gets real personal. I was a very, okay. very no, outgoing person. No, it's fine. I don't mind. Yeah. I talk yeah. about it on my channel all the time. I was yeah. a very, very outgoing person when I was younger. Hmm. I was hmm. like always the center of attention. I played in several heavy metal bands. I was like not the person I am now. Hmm. And I lost that somewhere along the way. I got very unhappy and mm. just kind of, I went through a, a, a point of depression. And even when I came out of that, I never got back to being out there guy. Mm. And I finally am at a point now where I'm like, well, I'm not like depressed anymore. I've been doing good for a while. I need to address that part because that's a part of who I am that I've ignored for 15 years. And I don't really want to just be the guy at, like, I don't want to wake up and I'm 45 and I still haven't left this house and actually made any real connections and any friends. That sounds yeah. miserable. It sounds like a miserable right. way to spend, mm. you know, I'm 35, I'm getting old. It sounds like a miserable way to spend the next 35 years of my life. So mm. figured I'm going to yeah. get out and not be like that. I want to meet people and shake hands and yeah. like have actual relationships with people in this community versus just names that I recognize from a handle on Instagram. Good yeah, for you, that's man. Cool. That's you really know, cool. I, I, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm an introvert as well, but I I force myself to be in community and uh, yeah. be a you know um, if I ran away to the mountains and disappeared, I, I feel like I would be okay. But <laughs> I do that but regularly. I, that's how I, I come yeah. back. I was joking at oh, Tiddly. Yeah. I'm like, this is the, my my social battery is done. I'm gonna go sit in my yeah, basement yeah. and play with lizards for three weeks. And... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you know, it was great kind of forcing myself to come out. AJ and yeah. you know, Brian from Who's Geckos, they pulled me out and I had a great time just meeting everybody and yeah, I did um, too. Trying, to, trying to force that that community and it's actually really nice and beautiful. And it was uh, and it was refreshing but, yeah. to go and meet like Mark from Northern Gecko. He was a legend yeah. in the game when I got into it mm. and to be able to shake that guy's hand and talk geckos with him and, you know, That's meet. Cool 
everybody I met, but like Donna came all the way over from the UK and I've known her for years and years and just so many faces like that, that we got to meet. It was, I wish it was a week long that I could really meet everybody. That's like the other show that we're going to do. The Flora and Fauna show will be much better for actually building relationships, not just saying, hi, oh, you look the same as you do on Facebook. Yeah, (laughs) that's cool. Um, And, you know, just a couple more questions, Brian, before we kind of uh, land the plane. Um, you know, work wise, I know you're super busy with all your animals. Do you have, do you feel like you have a good balance between the work that you have to do plus, uh, you know, recreation and just having fun? I do. I do. Okay. It, it helps a lot that a big part of my recreation is my work. Mm-hmm. I love what I do with the animals. I love making new pairings. I love mm-hmm. photography is that's about the only thing I like more than reptiles. And that's a huge part of my job is I get to photograph geckos all day long and mm-hmm. Yeah. And play with, you know, unload pictures and look at them all and load them all on the website. And it's, yeah, that's, a, it's a lot of fun. So it kind of takes that work-life balance, makes it a little more easier to manage because it doesn't feel yeah. like work a lot of the time. Yeah, because you enjoy it. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Um, and what's the worst part of the hobby for you? <laughs> if there if there isn't any, that's okay too. <laughs> um, The worst part of the hobby... The lineage. No. I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> Making a lot of people upset. Pick yeah. one that's middle of the road. Upset some people. Uh, <laughs> the, the worst part of the job is scrubbing tubs for sure. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. We'll, we'll go with that. It's it's the constant. Yeah, I Like I said, I've yeah. got probably 800 dirty tubs that need scrubbed and my hands crack and bleed from the soap. Yeah, and, yeah. But it beats sitting behind a desk all day. Totally. So. For sure. For sure. Um, <laughs> you, know, and, you know, we always end with... Uh, kind of this part, um, advice for new breeders, you know, what is, what is your uh, personal advice for new breeders that are trying to uh, break into the hobby and to start to collection? And also how can, uh, breeders new and old be successful in there? So I guess it's a two part question. Okay. So advice for breeders would be first decide if this is your job or your hobby, because if, depending on the answer to that question, you have to approach it very differently. For 99% of people, it should probably be your hobby. And I think it needs to be wide, more widely understood that there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic and perfectly fine. And that's where most people should fit. And if that's your hobby, just buy whatever you think looks cool and maybe have some cool stuff Mm -hmm. and enjoy the process. If you want it to be your job, treat it like a job. Sit down. Like I talked about earlier, don't go buy all the cool geckos and, oh, this one's pretty. I got to have it sit down and make a business plan. What do I want to hatch? What do I want to produce? How am I going to get people to notice me? What is my name? How am I going to run my company? What's, you know, what is it going to cost me to do this? How long can I do this without making money and just be floating this out of my bank account? Like it's no different than trying to open an ice cream store. Yeah. People don't think of it that way because it always starts as a hobby and works its way up. But when you get to that point, you want to do it for real. You got to treat it like a real job. For sure, man. For sure. That's awesome. Yeah, cool. Um, AJ, you have any other questions for, for I Brian? I think we, uh, we covered a lot. We, we took did? a lot of your time. So covered we'll lot. have you kind of yeah. uh, plug yourself here, Brian. I was going to ask you if you're going to vend any shows. I was going to try to bait mm-hmm. you into talking about Flora Fauna. So we got that out of the way. Where can people find you? What do you have coming up? We've already heard about your new merch site, which is super cool. Um, but kind of, you know, brag on yourself a little bit on what you got going on yeah so trip well, for right? shows i'll throw i'll throw you one the, the flora and fauna show i don't know yet if i'm gonna vend and bring animals or if i'm just gonna be there and possibly do a presentation i i'll, I'll have that announcement soon i'm sure i think i'll probably end up vending it won't be as big of an affair as when i normally vend a show but it's not as big of an affair yeah and then I will vend the, the plan is to do the Anaheim Super Show next July. Cool. will be my next like big nice. event okay. show I'm going to do. I was thinking and about then, that one too. So. <laughs> for you? Come out. You guys got to come out. I'll be there if you guys are both out awesome. there. Yeah, I'm, I'm planning on doing a whole end cap. And like I did in Vegas, two, 300 animals, make it a huge, nice. huge kind of deal and have a lot of fun with it. That'll be awesome. So I got that plan for next July. So maybe yeah. I'll and see then, you then. Uh, yeah, 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 it'd yeah. be cool. Then you can find me social media. My handle is AE Geckos across everything, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I am officially a TikTok creator. $9 worth. I don't want to brag. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm making three bucks a month off the TikTok, worth so it, that's it, pretty good. It. <laughs> and then altitudeexotics.com is my website. Um, my Black Friday sales coming up. That's always my nice. biggest sale of the year, both number of geckos and deals and discounts wise. Okay. That's going to be a huge, huge deal this year. And then Altitude Exotics Adventures is my travel website. I do adventure retreats. Um, started in Belize. I've done several in Belize. I absolutely love it there. And then this March is my first one in Africa. We're doing a wow. safari in Kenya. I have a wow. couple spots still open on that. Cool. It's about $3,100 a person, all inclusive, basically everything but airfare, private guides, land rovers. We've got a five national parks, food, lodging, the whole thing's covered. So I got cool. two rooms open. They're double occupancy rooms. So if you got somebody and their wife or just somebody you don't <laughs> mind spending a room with, we got some space if anybody wants to hit Africa with me. Cool. That's cool. Do you do those once a year, the trips? Um, I, ideally I'd like to do them three times a year is, is my wow. goal is to do two in Belize and one in Africa about every four months I do one. It's gone wonky with obviously COVID mm. screwed it all up and flights are so outrageously expensive right now. It's been hard. I haven't planned another Belize one cause flights down there are almost triple what they were when I started wow. doing this. So when things kind of even out, it'll get more regulated again, but nice. it's always a lot of fun. That's awesome, man. Yeah, Brian, man, we're we're super thankful for your time. We know you're busy, and uh, it it's, it's been a good time hanging out and chatting with you. Um, we hope Thank to catch you, you again soon. Honored that you asked me to come on. Thank, Thank you, you for much. being here. Yep. We appreciate you. For sure, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Brian.